We have seen the subject of landscape grow ever more popular from the 16th century onward. 18th and 19th century British buyers were hugely interested in landscape painting. And some of the greatest native artists of this time, such as John Constable and J.M.W. Turner, made landscapes their primary focus. We will start with one painter, however, whom we have already seen as a portrait painter, though even within that subject he evinced his devotion to landscape. That painter is Thomas Gainsborough. The market cart from 1786 is an example of Gainsborough's late landscape style, of which we saw hints in Mr. and Mrs. William Hallett from 1785. It rivals that portrait in size at six feet by five feet and a quarter inches. These two large pictures share the light, feathery technique of late Gainsborough paintings. Despite what would at first glance seem to be a really substantial scene, given the large trees, the partly shaded path, and the limited view of the sky, the effect is still one of airiness and light. This is, after all, an 18th century painting, and it will share these aspects with other 18th century paintings of other subjects as well. The cart is heavily laden with autumn produce of root vegetables and two young girls. It rolls on its way to market with the experienced horse leading the way, accompanied in front by a dog. Two boys walk alongside the cart, while in the foreground, a shepherd and his dog rest. At right, a man gathers wood under a tree. In the background, the light falls softly across a bank of clouds and filters through foliage. The leaves range from green to brown to yellow, affirming the season and perhaps serving too as a reminder of the passage of life. This painting was made two years before Gainsborough's death, and intimations of mortality would not be inappropriate to read into such an image. Yet it is a warm depiction, nostalgic perhaps about the countryside Gainsborough had long left behind and idealizes the seemingly simple lives of country dwellers. At its scale, we almost believe that we could walk into the scene ourselves and experience what Gainsborough wanted to believe was the truth about the English countryside, or at least wanted us to believe. The closest we have come to this vision before is with Rubens's landscapes, several of which Gainsborough knew and admired. The passage of time is indicated here in one physical way with this painting, through a pentimento now apparent to the naked eye without any imaging techniques. The upper layers of paint have thinned enough so that we can actually see an earlier position of the horse's head before Gainsborough repainted that section. In turn, John Constable was an avid admirer of Gainsborough's landscapes. Constable, whose dates were 1776 to 1837, was born in East Burgold in Suffolk. This was the same county on the east coast of England that Gainsborough hailed from. Constable came from a prosperous milling and farming family, but turned to art after meeting Sir George Beaumont in 1796. Beaumont was an important collector and an amateur painter of landscapes who encouraged the young man's gifts. We have already heard about Beaumont in this course as a patron of the new National Gallery a few decades later. Constable entered the Royal Academy School in 1799 and first exhibited at a Royal Academy exhibition in 1802. He was devoted to landscape, especially the Suffolk countryside where he had grown up. This area later came to be called Constable Country. While he lived in London permanently from 1816 onward, he visited Suffolk frequently and made pencil and oil sketches from nature, which served as the primary basis for his art. He also studied the old masters of landscape painting. Constable's move to large format landscapes in the late 1810s helped to make his reputation. A social conservative, his paintings were meant to preserve an image of rural harmony at a time when in fact there was unrest in provincial centers. Today, six Constable oil paintings are in the National Gallery's collection. Nothing indicates the increased public appreciation for landscapes as clearly as the larger size of the landscape paintings themselves. Like Gainsborough's market cart of a generation before, the hay wain, which is signed and dated 1821, measures six feet at its greatest extent, and it was not the first of Constable's six-footers to be displayed at the exhibitions of the Royal Academy. 
It has become, though, one of his most famous and beloved depictions of his store river boyhood landscapes. We see a cart, which could be called also a wain, in the middle of a mill pond pulled by three horses that are heading towards a ford across the river. At left is a picturesque cottage. Behind this section are towering old trees, while in the very front, a dog ranges the shore, staring at the wain and the horses. At the right of the cart, a small boat is tied up, which a fisherman approaches. Further on, just a tiny corner of the mill proper can be made out at the right. In the middle ground, haymakers work an extensive cultivated field. The season is high summer. Over all is a sweeping sky with large patches of blue, light clouds, and a few dark ones mixed in. The word that best describes the appearance of the scene is fresh. The water sparkles, light is plentiful, and the look of the sky suggests ample wind. But how did Constable create this appearance of freshness? He did so by working in one traditional fashion. He used drawings and oil sketches made over time at the Flatford Mill Pond itself, where this uh, scene was. But Constable introduced a step into his creative process that was unusual. He made a full-scale oil sketch for the composition, which is now also in London at the Victoria and Albert Museum, before painting the final picture. This was an unprecedented step, at least in part because of the time it would take and the material cost it was considerable to make a six-foot painting. But the step was important to Constable to make sure that he could balance having just the right compositional elements while still retaining the seeming spontaneity of paint application. He wanted his ideas to be worked out fully by the time he got to that final surface so his paint application would not seem labored and slow. He did make changes at the stage of the oil sketch for the haywain. It was at this point, for instance, that he added the empty boat awaiting the fisherman. Nonetheless, Constable, in the end, made still one large change to the final form of the haywain itself. He painted over a horse and rider in the foreground facing into the picture right near the dog. Constable was much interested in great past masters of landscape. Rubens' autumn landscape with view of at Stain in the early morning, which we saw in Lecture 14, was owned by Constable's patron, Sir George Beaumont, and the painter had first seen it in 1804. 17th-century Dutch painters, such as Jacob van Rausdal and uh, British predecessors, especially Gainsborough, also influenced Constable generally. But generally is the operative word. For what he admired on all of these earlier artists was their ability to convey a sense of nature itself. For Constable, nature was the first and last word. And the necessity of working from nature using sketches made in front of the important motifs was paramount. Constable managed to create his own truth to nature this way, and with his paint application, which featured the use of many lively brush strokes and also flecks of paint. These not only stand for different textures and convey the impression of sparkling reflections of light, they seem to animate the surface as an almost organic creation in itself. However, there still are differences between the oil sketch, the full-scale one, and the finished painting. Uh, if you ever have a chance to see them close in time, you will see that the final painting is still a little bit more finished, a little more traditional looking than the oil sketch. Finally, it was Constable's own engagement with this landscape of the Store River that suggests itself to the viewer. The mill was one that his family had operated for about 100 years. The cottage was occupied in his youth by a tenant of Constable's family. This land is not just where the painter grew up, in other words. It is where his family roots lay deep. When Constable exhibited the Haywain at the Royal Academy exhibition in the spring of 1821, it had many admirers, including the young French painter Jericho. It made a large impression when it was sent to Paris uh, for the Salon of 1824, with this time Delacroix responding to it strongly. Thus, two of the major French Romantic painters found something that resonated with them in Constable's humble English country scene. The cornfield, which is signed and dated 1826, also reproduced, though with artistic license, a scene from Constable's boyhood.
The scene shows part of Fen Lane, which Constable would have walked along on his way to school in Dedham from his home in East Burgold. Painted in the year Constable turned 50, it seems an appropriate combination of his nostalgic recall, studies from life, and imagination. Trees shade the road at left and right, while the cornfield and farm workers, which are illuminated by a broad swath of light, can be seen in the middle ground. More corn also grows on the hill at the left. A boy has stopped to drink water from a pool while a shepherd moves his flock down the lane, the sheepdog holding up the rear. Donkeys graze near the pool. In the distance is a village and above a constable sky, reminding us that he made many individual studies of clouds throughout his career. As with the hay wane, Constable also drew upon sketches and even finished paintings, sometimes made years before to realize this composition. Thus, the dead tree that we see at the left of the painting is a descendant of one that was still thriving in a painting from 1802. When Constable sent the painting to Paris for the Salon of 1827, he included in its entry in the exhibition catalog a few lines from a poem by the 18th century Scottish poet James Thompson. The poem was The Seasons, and he took the lines from the section Summer, first published in 1727. A fresher gale begins to wave the wood and stir the stream, sweeping with shadowy gust the fields of corn. The suggestion of the presence of the invisible wind, made manifest by the movement of foliage, the corn stalks, and the clouds, was always of interest to Constable. But it's important to see that he did understand this painting as an equivalent to poetry. It was still unsold in Constable's studio at the time of his death in 1837. A group of his friends gathered money together to purchase this painting and present it to the still youthful National Gallery in the same year. It was the first of the six Constables to enter the collection. Joseph Mallard William Turner, whose dates were 1775 to 1851, was a Londoner for his entire life, but who lived in a world of his own imagination. From a modest background, he rose through early recognition of his talents. Trained at the Royal Academy School beginning in 1789, Turner first exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1790, and in 1802, he became a full member at age 26, as the youngest academician ever. His subject range was wide, but based on landscape as an essential component. His first visit to Italy in 1819 was crucial for his development of a bright palette, and he would travel abroad frequently for inspiration. Turner's knowledge of landscape and history painting was also wide. He admired the 17th century Dutch landscape painters, revered Claude Laurent, but also Titian and Raphael and was knowledgeable about the growing British landscape tradition itself. From the start, he had devoted patrons who appreciated his innovations in watercolor and oil paint. In his will, he bequeathed to the nation all of his art still in his possession at the time of his death. This became known as the Turner Bequest. Most of these works are now in Tate Britain, but nine paintings remain in the National Gallery. We will start with a relatively early work, Dido Building Carthage, signed and dated 1815. Recall how in Lecture 13 I mentioned that two paintings by Turner hung with paintings by the 17th century French painter Claude Lorrain, and that you would have to wait for an explanation of why. Now is the time for the story. Turner first exhibited the painting Dido Building Carthage at the Royal Academy in 1815, where it made quite a splash. The painting's title, Turner's name, and the date appear on the wall at the far left hand. It is another large painting at five feet by seven feet and seven inches, and one of 10 paintings from his career devoted to the story of the ancient North African town of Carthage. This painting depicts the legendary founding of Carthage by Dido, the queen of Tyre. This story was related in the first book of Virgil's Aeneid. Dido is at the left in a light dress with a diadem, observing the building of her new city. Across from her on the right is somewhat ominously the tomb she had built for her late husband, Sicaeus, who had been murdered by her own brother. 
Later in the Aeneid, Dido will commit suicide after Aeneas leaves her for telling the enmity of the two cities of Rome and Carthage, but she has not yet met him here. The architecture is certainly classical in style, and the exquisitely modulated lighting, as well as the port scene itself, clearly do recall Claude's art. Turner was fascinated with Claude from the very beginning of his career, particularly with Claude's sense of color and light. These were the artistic interests that Turner himself held most dear. The scene is certainly more chaotic and cluttered than we would find in Claude's paintings, but the connections are nonetheless clear. Turner never sold this painting, keeping it in his studio until his death. As I mentioned before, over a period of years, he had decided to bequeath a significant number of his paintings to the nation. But in his will, he stipulated that Dido building Carthage and another painting, Sun Rising Through Vapor, would have to be hung at the National Gallery with two Claude paintings from the Angerstein collection, The Embarkation of the Queen of Sheba and Landscape with the Marriage of Isaac and Rebecca. We saw both of those paintings in Lecture 13. But another part of the will stipulated that this all had to be done within the first year after his death or the gallery would not be allowed to keep his paintings. The will was disputed, but the executors nonetheless allowed the two paintings to go to the National Gallery less than a month before the deadline would expire. The gallery obtained official title in 1856, fortunately, after a suit by Turner's relatives contesting the will had been settled. Now, Dido building Carthage had problems with paint flaking from its surface early on in its career, certainly at least within the first 25 years after it was painted. And I would normally disqualify such a work from featuring in this course. But it has been stabilized now, more or less, and it affords a rare occasion when we can see a model and its artistic descendant together for such close comparison. Turner's request that his paintings hang with the two Claudes indicates certainly his admiration for Claude, but also his self-confidence about his own contribution to the art of landscape. If we move forward in time, nearly a quarter of a century, we can see the astonishing evolution of Turner's art in the painting The Fighting Temeraire from 1839. Solid masses have now been almost entirely eclipsed by the suggestion of forms and color and light that are now the focus of the painting. Yet, like the Carthage painting, it is a meditation by Turner on history and time. And though it represents contemporary history, it is actually as imaginative as the Carthage painting. The full title, as given by Turner, when exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1839, is The Fighting Temeraire Tugged to Her Last Birth to Be Broken Up. 1838. The painting recalls the sad end to a noble warship built exactly 40 years earlier. Her supreme moment had come during the Battle of Trafalgar when she fought alongside Lord Nelson's flagship victory in this great defeat of Napoleon's French and allied Spanish navies. This defeat took place in October 1805 off the coast of Spain. The uh, Temeraire was used for other purposes for several decades, but the decision was finally made in 1838 to decommission her and sell her for the value of her lumber. The buyer in August 1838 was a timber merchant who had her towed up the Thames 50 miles to his wharf to be broken up. It is the end of the journey that Turner depicts, or rather, he imagines. The Temeraire, now just a pale golden ghost, is towed by a little steam tugboat at left. At right, we can see distant masts along the horizon and a glowing sunset. A moon has already risen above the doomed ship at the left. A boy bobs at right, oblivious to the drama. On one level, the metaphor is an obvious one. A sun is setting on an era, and a glorious past is treated with indifference by the present. The subject, though, may have also evoked for Turner thoughts about the passing of time in his own life as well. He was a young man when the Battle of Trafalgar took place, and now one of its remaining stars would meet its end. Now, there is no indication that Turner actually saw the ship being towed towards its destination. And Turner's considerable liberties with fact here should be pointed out. 
So the sun is somehow manages to set in the east here if this is, in fact, the final birth of the Temeraire. The funnel of the tug ship is at the front rather than amidships, as it should be. And the Temeraire is shown with its masts still intact. These would have been stripped for reuse by the Royal Navy even before it had been sold. It is not that Turner didn't know better in each case. These were conscious choices for greater artistic effect. This was a symbolic understanding of history that transcended mere fact, but called up over and over again the idea of the frailties of humans, the sweep of history itself, and the inevitability of mortality for peoples, cities, and things like boats. Unlike Dido building Carthage, this painting is in very good condition, which allows us to fully enjoy the pleasures of paint as Turner himself clearly did. The magical transformation of brushes loaded with colored oil paint into a sunset and moonlight in the sky and reflected on the water, of smoke and fire from the tug and the misty clouds above is indeed the primary pleasure here, even above the sentimental or philosophical charms of its subject. Writers compared this painting to poetry or music. In turn, it stimulated authors to consider the subject. For instance, Herman Melville, who saw the painting in 1857, wrote a poem about it, The Temeraire, published in 1866. But by no means was Turner a conservative curmudgeon stuck in the past, as even an initial glance at the painting Rain, Steam, and Speed reveals. First exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1844, in this case, style and subject seem perfectly attuned. Turner subtitled the painting, The Great Western Railway, and the specific spot on this line can be identified. This is the Maidenhead Railway Bridge over the Thames. This bridge was built for the railway by Isambar Brunel and finished in 1839. It was a double arch bridge that was itself an engineering marvel with each arch spanning 128 feet. In the painting, Turner shows only one track, but it was in fact a two-way bridge. The view is toward the east and London. That is, the train has left London and is speeding out for the countryside. Other than the steam engine moving on a diagonal towards us, very little is distinct here. With time and effort, we can make out a group of figures on the far bank of the Thames between the railway bridge and the older bridge depicted at the left. There is also a small boat on the river and a plowman over at the far right. There is even a hare running ahead of the train uh, on the bridge. This was a late addition to the painting, and its color has what we call sunk into the surroundings, making it nearly impossible to see now, unfortunately. That's true even in person. The individual carriages of the train are open to the elements and would primarily be used for cargo. You could, in fact, ride inexpensively in them as well, but we see no indication of passengers in this painting in those carriages. It is important that the painting's title is about nature and motion. The rain swirls near the train, but sun breaks through as well. The train dashes forward through the elements. Its steam, which is witnessed by several puffs of smoke, suggesting the power that's propelling it along. The swirling elements seem to echo the movement of the train itself. All is dynamism and really thrilling in this case. Turner had his detractors at the time, but I'm always surprised actually by how these paintings, which seem almost proto-abstract in the way the artist was so absorbed into his materials, how these paintings could be quite warmly received by most critics. The physicality of the paint and intensity of the coloring were noted by writers on its debut in 1844, but generally with approval. But then again, 1844 was already part of the modern world in many ways, as the presence and celebration of the steam railway indicates. Turner was in the end a painter of heroic landscapes, but such heroism could be found in his world, not just in the past. Let us now turn to two French paintings that also deal with nature, though in rather different ways. Jean-Louis André Théodore Jericho, whose dates were 1791 to 1824, born in Rouen, was a largely self-taught artist from a prosperous family. 
He studied in Paris with Carl Vernet and Pierre Guérin, but with greatest dedication on his own by going to the Louvre and studying works of art there. In 1816-1817, Jericho traveled to Italy and to England in 1820-21. Remember, he saw the Constable painting then. Jericho developed a personal approach to history painting on the grand scale, reflecting his interest in human responses in extreme conditions. But his early death cut a promising career short. Jericho's horse frightened by lightning from about 1813, 1814, suggests that the interest in nature seen in 19th century British painting was certainly not foreign to art made on the European continent. Also, Jericho's attention to emotions under intense conditions actually applies to this painting of a horse as well. Horse studies and finished paintings of horses were common in Jericho's art right around this time, 1812 to 1814. He was said to have studied the horses in the royal stables at Versailles. Compared to some of his dramatic large-scale uh, paintings made for salon exhibition, this modest size work, just a little over 19 by 23 inches, seems at first very restrained and sober in its presentation. Yet look closely here at the tension in the horse's back and neck as it pulls backward, and look at the flared nostril and enlarged eye. Here we can see fear manifested, and in the background we see the reason for it, a lightning storm depicted with colorful intensity. Jericho's style combined his desire to be truthful to nature and emotionally expressive at the same time. The small painting encapsulates these goals perfectly. Gustave Courbet, whose dates were 1819 to 1877, was a leader of the realist painters of the mid-19th century. Born in the town of Ornon, which was near France's border with Switzerland, he came from a prosperous farming family. He moved to Paris in 1839 and studied there with Charles de Steuben. A trip to the Netherlands and Belgium in 1846-47 was influential for his stylistic development and his commitment to a thoroughgoing naturalistic style, which he aligned with his progressive political views. Uh, remember that Constable is using naturalism for his conservatism, so it can be used by either kind of political, political camp. Courbet's intent was to paint modern subjects in a modern style, but he was also a brilliant marketer of art. He would hold independent exhibitions of his art when his paintings were not accepted at the salons or in other public venues, sometimes actually competing with them directly by holding them at the exact same time. Courbet was imprisoned as a revolutionary in 1871-72 during a time of political upheaval and moved to Switzerland in 1873. There are six Courbet paintings in the National Gallery, ranging from landscape to still life to self-portraiture. Young Ladies on the Bank of the Seine, painted before 1857, is Courbet's smaller scale version of a famous or perhaps infamous painting that was actually shown in the Salon in 1857. It returns to an old subject we have seen before, woman in nature with a new attitude. We see two young women reclining on the grass next to the Seine. In some ways, this is a subject that can be traced back to the Renaissance, where depictions of female nudes were shown out of doors. Courbet, however, took what had become a visual cliché and transformed it. The attire and attitude of these women proved more shocking than most nudes would in 1857, for there is nothing about these women that allows us to pretend that they are actually nymphs or allegorical figures. It was their contemporary dress, their unidealized faces, and the knowing look of the woman in front that proved so shocking. What isn't quite clear here is whether she wears a thin white summer dress or is revealing her undergarments. Her head is resting on a pile of fabric. Could this actually be her dress that she has taken off? Either way, she doesn't look very proper in her behavior, nor is her splayed out pose or the pose of her companion very ladylike. Thus, the title is ironic. No one would consider this pair young ladies. Courbet's insistence on truth-telling that many young Parisian women didn't act the way women were typically shown in paintings was expressed in his style as well, which emphasized the flat application of paints quickly brushed on. 
The National Gallery painting was likely a study for the larger painting, which is now in the Musée du Petit Palais in Paris. Despite Courbet's often genuinely revolutionary approaches to both painting technique and subject matter, he was still as capable as any old master artist of working on a subject methodically, beginning with drawings and oil studies before executing the final work. With Courbet, we begin to see a greater freedom of approach to contemporary subject matter and a more challenging approach to painting technique. These are issues we will explore in greater length in our next lecture on French art when we turn to the Impressionists.